Okay, so this is a talk about IO Twins. IO Twins is uh, an European project. This is a, a conceptual talk. We will not see any kind of code, so so you may rest. But the, the kind of code that you, you learned with the Spark tutorial is something that could help you doing things like we do in this project. So my name is Eduardo Grails Guerrido. I will present this in, in name of the IO Twins team. Uh, and this talk also contains material prepared by Irene Meta and Feliu Serra Buriel. So this is the Dio Twins team at Barcelona Supercomputer Center. So you can see it's, it's not a small team and it's also very diverse. Um, in this team, my role is to be a mobility researcher. So I do research on mobility, how people move. We will talk about this at, at this talk. So to present myself, I will tell you a bit about my story and how I ended up here giving this talk to, to you. Currently, I work at the Scientific Visualization Group at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Uh, I started almost two years ago, so I joined as a mobility researcher. Before that, I was an assistant professor at the Universidad del Desarrollo in Chile. So I'm actually, I'm from Chile. I was there for almost three years, doing also research on mobility and also information visualization and human computer interaction and, and also computational social science. So I, I, I tend to work a lot with data and try to get value, value from data. Before that, I worked at the industry. So I, in Chile also, I joined the Telefonica Research and Development Center that was in Chile some years ago. And before that, I did my PhD here in Barcelona at Universidad Pompeu Fabra and also at the Yahoo Labs that were, that were here. So actually, they were on the same building and I spent almost all my time at the Yahoo Labs. So my, my thesis was about biased behavior on the web so algorithmic bias, data bias, and cognitive bias, how, how these different biases affect what you learned from the data. So actually, even though I didn't work with mobility there at, at that time, it's a, it's a topic that also is present when you do mobility analysis because the, the data is biased. So if you work with mobile phone data, the people that use a phone is not a representative sample of the population. So you need to consider all the different biases in the data. So perhaps the, the work that uh, I, I love the most from what I have done is a study about what was the effect of Pokemon Go on the pools of the city in my hometown, Santiago, Chile. So many years ago when Pokemon Go was launched, it was a total frenzy on the city of people playing, playing the game at every time of the day, at, at every place of the city. And we wanted to see if we could measure how much, how much more, how, how more, what was the, the increase in the number of people on the street, on the public space that could be explained by the availability of Pokemon Go. And where, when, what, at what parts of the city, at what time of the day, and so on. And, and we did so using mobile phone data. So it's a very uh, interesting study because it, it starts with all this motivation, not, not about, uh, I like Pokemon, but also how the city uh, takes life thanks to a mobile phone game, how places that are uh, perceived as unsafe, so a dark place at night, become full of people, and because of that, they become safe. So there is a theory that explains that by Jane Jacobs, it's called the, the ice on the street. So at the end, it's not only uh, a study about how much people play Pokemon Go, but also how can you motivate people to, to go to the street and enjoy the public space? But of course, today we cannot do that, but hopefully in the future, we will be able to, to do so. And although, although the, the previous project was kind of fun and interesting. We also do very serious, very serious things using this type of data. So here in this picture, I am the, the one with the green hair. So my, 
my hair is not green anymore, but I, I will dye it in another color soon. Uh, we are here with other researchers, but also people from the Transportation Authority in Santiago, also actual urban planners that take decisions about how the city works, how the city is designed. And we use mobile phone data to understand uh, where, do, where do the people that uses metro live? So who uses cars? Who uses public transport? Who uses bikes? Who lives nearby the, their work? So those, those questions may seem easy to answer, but actually there is no data to do so because the, the type of data that is usually taken, take, taken into account to answer those questions is, is expensive and hard to get. It's mostly surveys and those surveys are held every 10 years. And the, the last survey in Santiago was held in 2012, so almost 10 years ago. And in those years, there was no Uber or, uh, or Cabify, which is a similar service. There were no uh, kick scooters, electric kick scooters. So shared mobility was not a thing in those years. So actually, even though urban planners use that data sets, they are obsolete now. So you need new ways to, to measure how people move in a city and mobile phone data provides, provides uh, signals to measure that. But it's not something that you can measure directly. You need to look at proxy behavior, proxy data. So that's why it's a research challenge to do that. That's the kind of work that I do, but now let's talk about IO twins. So what is IO twins? So what is this kind of weird, fancy name? So if you look at the definition, uh, so IO twins is a big data platform for optimized and replicable industrial and facility management models. And it's a, it's a very big project in the Horizon 2020 um, funding from the European Commission. So you see here lots of logos. It's because every logo represents uh, a company, a university, a research center, or even a football team that joins, they join to make a reality, a very ambitious project like this one. So they want to be, create this big, big platform that consumes and generates lots, lots of data. And you want to use that platform to inform, to help, to augment facility management. So I, I will explain to you later what, what it is. So what are, the, what are the keywords behind this project? What are the different areas that matter to, to this project? So on the, on the one hand, we have uh, facility management. So there is a place, usually a, a big place, a complex place, both in terms of infrastructure, but also in terms of functionality, also in terms of who goes into that place. So that is the, the, the circle on the bottom. On the left, you have an, another circle with concepts such as data science. So you need to analyze data, you get to extract the value from data. IoT, which is Internet of Things, sensors that are recording everything that is happening and then send this to a server to store this data. This server could be Marino Nostrum. Big data, because the amount of data that you need and also that is available about these facilities because of these sensors is huge. So you need specialized ways to process, process the data, to run analysis, and to extract knowledge. And also simulation, because you, don't, you do not only want to look at the past, you also want to look at the future. Not only you, you do not only want to do prediction, you, want, you also want to look what will happen in the future for Sorry. this facility. Yes? Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Uh, is is uh, this data available uh, and open or, or, or you are, or, you were working with uh, the closer data and uh, a specific form of uh, obtaining the, the data. Thank you. It's a it's a great question, actually. Um, well, it depends on the project. So, uh, as, as I say here in the in the text, the project is comprised by twenty three partners and twelve industrial test beds. So each test bed is a scenario, is a configuration where we we test. The project. In, in our case, I will introduce our test bed soon. Most of the data is, is private, but there is also public data. And also, the, the, I will make available to you uh, a notebook 
and a, and, a, and a repository with data so you can do some of the analysis that I introduced in this talk. Okay, thank so you. Actually, some, sometimes you, you have private data. So if you have a building, you know who's entering and you know who is exiting the building. But there, is, there, there may be also public data or open data regarding those people and also regarding the building. So it's a mixture of, of both things. And the other concept is people and machine behavior, because you, you may want, you may have lots of data, but this data can describe something, can describe how people move, can describe what people do within a building, within a facility. Uh, you can describe how machines are behaving, how, how the infrastructure of the building is behaving, is working. You have energy management, you have temperature, um, you have consumption and so on. And the different intersections of these concepts are, 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 are particular areas or, or disciplines of study. So you have a smart industries here, urban sensing, indoor mobility, and, and, they, and at the intersection of all these areas is this project, are you doing this? Here is a link to the homepage where you can see a description of all the different partners and test, test beds of the project. But here I will tell you about three test beds. So the first one is Camp Nou, is the Barcelona Stadium. So you know it's a big, a big facility. It, it can contain almost 100,000 people simultaneously. Um, there is also Examon, it's a supercomputer facility similar to, to Mare Nostrum, and even though it doesn't have as much people as can know, it has much more hardware, much more infrastructure. It has lots of computers, and those computers communicate between them because they want to, to run your, your jobs and want to run other jobs and so on. They, want, they need to synchronize the storage. They need to maintain temperature and so on. And another test bed is the Aspen Vienna's uh, Urban Lakeside, which is a smart city, a controlled smart city within a city. So it's fully sensorized. You know everything that is happening there. Of course, that sounds a bit scary, but it's an experiment. So the, the good thing about the experiments is that, is, is that you can learn also about the, the bad things about the, these full sensorifications. You can study privacy also and so on. So this is the kind of a scenario that might, might, might be helped by using data, by using sensors, and by using uh, all these concepts that I, I told you about. So what are the different concepts? Or what are the different uh, tasks that, that we may want to, to do in facility management? So for instance, we want to make the operation of a building or facility more efficient. We want to optimize the energy usage. We want to know how to predict different uh, failures in the system so we can do maintenance before. So we don't do repairing, but we do maintenance. So we can know what if there are signals that a specific node from this supercomputer is going to fail. So we can take measures for that instead of having to assume all the consequences of that failure. And also, what if we have past, past events that we want to understand? So we can use more data to try to get knowledge about what happened so we can prevent it in the future. But also if you have sensors that give information about how people use the facility, you can improve the experience of the place. You can make the, the visit to the place, you can make working there, you can make interacting with others a much more efficient and pleasant experience. You can also increase the safety of the place. And you can also study how people behave under specific circumstances. So you, you may also want to do studies, not about the facility, but about what people does in the facility, how people interact. So in these uh, times of uh, COVID, this is super important because you need to understand how people um, react to the other restrictions. So how, how can we make sure that the, this office, this facility is a safe place in times of COVID? 
you need to have data. You need to observe people. You need to understand how people behave to answer that way. So let's talk about the, the test bed that we are working on at, at Barcelona Supercomputing Center. It's the test bed number five from the project, and it's called uh, NU CAMNO. So what is CAMNO? CAMNO is the Barcelona Football Club Stadium, right? And actually, the, the name CAMNO means new field, because at, at some point in time, the, study, the, the stadium was new. So the NU CAMNO is the new, new stadium. And the idea of this stadium, of the, of the new iteration of the stadium, is to not only be uh, a very innovative and um, vanguardistic place, as everything that the football club does, but also to integrate in the environment in a way that no stadium has done before. So, so the, the idea here is that you can go to the stadium if you live in the place, if you go through this neighborhood, there are no barriers to enjoy to enjoy the place. So it, it's kind of a complex in, intervention. But also it's complex in the sense that the stadium is so big and so important for the, for, for the city, not only because there are football matches there, it's also because lots of people visit the stadium. So actually the, the, the Barcelona Museum is the second most visited museum in the city. So there are thousands of people going there every day before COVID. So today is, it's not the same, of course. And, and we hope, we all hope that at some point in the near future, we can do all these things again. So, so you cannot just stop this facility from working and say, we will take a few years to, to create a new stadium because it's a place that has, a, has an important functionality for the city, not only for recreation, but also for the economic purposes. And one of the, the, the ideas that were proposed at the Barcelona Football Club was what if we do the renovation in different phases? So it's actually a real-time renovation. You close only the part of the building that needs to be reconstructed and all the other parts keep working. So the stadium continues to work, soccer matches are still played, the museum still works and people can visit and enjoy the football club Barcelona urban style. So actually that's a, a very cool idea. You can see here is a, a, a video in YouTube that shows you the process. But there are some things that you need to think about when, when proposing the, this kind of stuff. And one of these is safety. So if you want to make this place safety, there are regulations that say, okay, so you need, if you're working in a, renovation, you need to have an evacuation plan that considers the different modifications that you're doing in your building and also the restrictions. So if you say this part of the building is closed, that changes the way that people are supposed to evacuate the, the building. So for every small change in the building, you need to have a new evacuation plan. You need to understand how people will react in case of an emergency. So in this particular test bed, the, the task that we want to help, we want to inform and, and that we want to solve using this platform, using all these methods and keywords that I mentioned before, is to inform the design and the evaluation of evacuation plans, to predict, to simulate all the different things that could happen during an emergency in the building when this phase renovation and construction is happening. So it's not a simple problem. And that's why you need all this kind of funding and all this big construction uh, to, to solve it. For instance, what are the different questions that you, you may ask when designing an evacuation plan? So how will people react to an emergency? So you, this is a picture from the stadium. You see lots of people there. What happens if it's, there is an earthquake? Uh, or anything that makes all those people to get scared and try to escape from the place. In theory, people will be quiet and wait to have uh, a clear route 
to move and that route is indicated by signs so so you know where you have to go that's what should happen in theory but if if we have learned something in this pandemic is that even when things are clearly marked and unsigned people won't follow them so it's not an easy problem to solve the other question does everyone move in the same way so does everyone react in the same way of course not there are many differences in how people that, that determine how people react to an emergency this includes so i have a kid so i am with friends i'm in a group or am i am i am, am i alone people from different cultures also behave differently so someone from asian countries will move differently at different pace than people from latin america so all these different questions are important when you see a scenario like this because the evacuation plan of an office of an of, of an office building already knows what is the profile of people that is going to that to this place already knows how much people are going to be there already knows how the space is going to be used already knows what is the demographic profile of, of the people in the evacuation but here there is a lot of uncertainty about that you don't know how many of, of those people are tourists you don't know how many of those are elders how many are young how many are, are together how many are tourists in a group and you need that kind of information to design an efficient evacuation plan so where does the name of the project come from i haven't told you that and now is the time to do that so it's called io twins because we will work with what is called a digital twin so in the real world you have people that interact according to the things that they do in a in a digital twin context you try to create a, a virtual instance of someone that resembles people from the real world so that's why in this graphic you see the same number of agents or digital twins as people in, in the real world and the interactions between them are the same as in the agent-based model sometimes a digital twin um, has an identity so for instance in a medical context there may be an, a digital twin of me that simulates how i react to different um, to different medicine so i so so they can so i can get a personalized treatment for a, a given disease that, that I might have. In the case of a stadium, we don't need the identity, we just need the demographic profile. So I know that groups, a, a, a group of tourists is coming, a, a family is coming, a, a couple is coming, a group of friends is coming, is coming, and so on. And the, these are the relationships with, between them, and this is how they tend to behave in a given scenario. So that's why it's called uh, IO twins, because in, in most facilities uh, there are many sensors, there are many uh, information coming from this uh, Internet of Things context, and we build in digital twins of many things. So in this case, it's people, but in other cases, it's computers, it's infrastructure, and so on. Usually, the, these simulations. The, the area that covers these simulations is called agent-based modeling because the digital twin is encoded as an agent. So what is the, the meaning of, of this agent-based modeling? If you know games, you probably have some notion of this because here there is an artificial world that may resemble or may not resemble a, a real world. In our case, it does. And this world is populated by agents. So in this artificial space, these agents live and interact with, with the world and with other agents according to a set of predefined rules. And the, the, the beauty of this kind of method is that usually you define a very simple artificial world, a very simple um, set of rules for agents 
But if the world is well designed and if the rules are well designed too, even though they are simple, or, or maybe simple is not the word, but a, a very good and very elegant abstraction of how the world works and how the agents relate, the simulation allows you to capture emergent collective patterns. Now the question is, what is an emergent behavior that, that emerges from this? So there is a very nice and interesting game. It's called the parable of the polygons. You can find it on the internet. When, when, when you see different types of polygons living in the same space. So here, the artificial world is, this, is, is the black box. And you have two types of agents, the triangles and the squares, the yellow triangles and the blue squares. And there is a status for each one of these agents. So they are happy or not. So the, the idea here is that everyone wants to be happy. But the thing is that these agents may not like to be surrounded by people that is different from them. So there is a, here the rule is if I sur if if I'm surrounded by 10, 10 other agents, if a specific amount of these agents is like me, I'm happy. It's very important to, to be surrounded by people like you because that makes you that makes easier to communicate and to live with them, right? But it's also important to live with people that is different to you because it exposes you different realities. It opens your mind. If, if you only talk with people that think like you, you start to polarize uh, what, what you think. So, so here if you say, I, I'd be happy if 15% of the people is different. It's a very small, uh, if, uh, if it's a very small percentage. Or you can say, uh, I'd be happy if, if I, if even if I have 90% of different people surrounding me. Actually, I love the diversity, so I, I, I want to be surrounded by lots of people. So if this rule is, is broken, the agent moves to an empty cell. And then the simulation, what does is to, to, to run, the sim, to, to, run to, to make many iterations until everyone has found a, a place to be happy. This is the simulation and, and these very simple rules it's called the Schelling model of segregation and Schelling won a Nobel prize because of this. Because he, he demonstrated that with these very simple rules and actually, even when you think that you like diversity, you, you tend to live in a segregated place and cities tend to, to become segregated. Even if you, you, you say that you like the diversity. So it's not so. It's not a very simple problem, and this is what is called emergent behavior because you don't you don't program the the collective movement, the collective decisions in the in the in the in the simulation. You just you just program a single agent decisions, but at the end you see how they work in groups, how they work collectively. So that is the type of knowledge that you get from the simulation if it's well designed. And actually, there are many uh, areas of applications for agent-based modeling at different spatial scales. So you can analyze very, group, very big groups in the city, and also you can analyze individual behavior, as we do in this project. And uh, there are lots of areas. So there, here is a link to a, a book about agent-based modeling and geography. It's very good. You can see a lots of examples and, and links to, to other projects. So in our case, what we want to do is to see how people behave in the scenario of evacuation. So uh, the typical visit to the stadium is I have a place to enter. I go to my seat. I might do some activities. I want, might, might go to the bathroom. I might go to eat something. And then when the match is over, I seek for the exit and I go home. Or maybe you go to another place to have a drink. So we will talk about that later. So actually, it's a very simple description. 
perhaps we can program that, but we will start to see that it's it's not easy to, to solve that. So for instance, here in the image, the, the grid line depicts two, two ways of finding the exit in a, in a room, probably a conference room or, or a restaurant. You can see that one is more realistic than the other, even, the, even though the, the two different paths shown here um, are mathematically correct in the sense that they represent a very, a very optimal way of, of reaching the exit. But one, one of them makes the, this person practically touch every surface on, on its way to the exit. And even though that, that path is a bit shorter than the other, it's not the way that people behave. Because you, you, you try to avoid collisions with things. But also in a, in a, in a scenario like the, the stadium, you, also, you want to avoid um, colliding with other people. But what happens when you, can, you, you cannot avoid that? Or what happens when, even though the shortest path, the shortest path uh, tells you to go to the right, because that, that's where the emergency exit is, what if you see a large crowd moving in the opposite direction? Do you follow them? Do you feel, um, do, do you feel obligated to move with them and so on? So it's not an, it's not an easy, easy question. So e e even in, in terms of programming how people behave, it's a very challenging problem. Also, the typical solutions that if you, if you look at evacuation plan, pedestrian simulator and, and keywords like that on Google, you will find there are lots of projects that, that do this. But usually they work in these very um, controlled settings like an office where you know who is there, where the, the environment is not so complex. But here is very, it, it, it's complex because it, it's not, it's impossible to avoid collisions. As I told you before, everyone behaves differently in, a, in an emergency situ situation. In this context, people have to take very difficult decisions and under pressure, sometimes we don't make the most rational decision. So it's a, it's a, it's a difficult problem. It's a, it's a very interesting problem too. So if we want to build a solution, what will we, what will we do? Following the, the different tutorials that you have seen today, we have lots of data sources. We will describe some of them later. Uh, from these data sources, we will do some kind of data science, data-driven mobility models. These models will help us learn more about how people behave. So we will put this knowledge into rules for the simulator. And both the simulator and our analysis will provide knowledge, information, insights regarding facility management and planning. So that seems like a reasonable architecture from a technical point of view. However, as I told you, we really need to understand who is visiting the, the stadium. This is a problem that can be simplified a lot, but e even though if it's simplified, it's a complex problem because the stadium is tied, is tightly connected to the city. The, the visitors of the stadium depend a lot of the city configuration. So we need to look at this problem from a conceptual framework of the city that will help us to, to learn who is visiting the stadium how would these people behave? It's not, you don't behave the same if you have two, two persons that are equal in demographic terms, but one is hungry and the other is not, they will, be, they will behave differently. One will buy something, the other will not. One will move faster, the other will not. So you need to consider all these different uh, small differences. And, all, in, and the only way to, to find, to identify which of those differences are important and even as important as identifying them is to measure them, is to look at the city that surrounds the stadium. And to look at the city, you need to have this conceptual framework. We work with the city protocol, which defines the city as a complex system, as a network of nodes. And there are many multiple networks. There is a network for information, a network for architectural 
um, structure, the water information, the water structure, energy structure. The, how do you get the, the garbage out of the city? How do you move people around the city? How the nature is present on the city, and so on. And we use this framework to look at the problem, to define what are we going to analyze? What, what are we going to measure from the people and also from the building? So if we, if, we, if we write the different city layers defined by the city protocol or over the, the concepts from our potential architecture, we see that different layers are present at different parts of the, of the architecture. So we start to see that the data sources not only come from different uh, sensors or different entities, but they also describe different aspects of both the city and, and people. We also see that what we are what we're doing in the machine learning aspect, I mean, sim and the simulation aspect is to abstract the society, the society that goes to, to the stadium. And the knowledge that we are generating is all, it's about buildings, it's about the infrastructure of the city. We are not creating insights regarding a specific agents but about how their collective behavior is related to a built domain. So we can use this to, to create a very nice diagram of how the, this project is, a structure, is a structured. So in the conceptual level, we want to do facility management and planning at Camno. To do that in, 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 in the context of this phased renovation, we need to evaluate many different scenarios. Scenarios regarding how, may, how much people is in the stadium, what happens in the stadium, what is the state of the reconstruction of the stadium. To evaluate these scenarios, we need at least two sources of input. Behavioral rules for the different agents that come from society, but also we need the, the configuration from the building. We need to know what parts of the building are open, what are closed, and so on. And these behavioral rules are learned from our analysis of the different uh, data sources. One comes from sensor data from the build domain. We also have behavioral data because according to the communication network, we know what people does in the city. And also we have city about, uh, data about the city that comes from the environment. Usually this data is managed by the city council or, or, or similar public institutions. And if we look at this project from the lens of the implementation, our objective is to evaluate evacuation behavior at Camp Nou. To do this, we will use some kind of visualization, some kind of user interface, some kind of um, aggregated analysis of all the simulation of evacuation scenarios that we have built using agent-based modeling this agent-based modeling is informed by what we learned using data science, particularly in data-driven mobility models. And this is what we are going to, to see next. And all this data science is held about uh, over digital traces and open data from input sources. So you can see that here we have two different layers to describe the, the same problem. It's very important to understand what you are solving with data uh, before doing the analysis or while doing the analysis. So this is ongoing work. So I, can, I cannot show you yet, uh, this is the, how, how people behave in a simulation at Camp Nou because we are doing that. But we, we do have final results regarding how people behave in Barcelona and, and Camp Nou. So this is, is the, what we call data-driven mobility. The first thing we do is to define what is mobility. So essentially mobility is when you study how people move from a here to a, a there. And, and that's why you have lots of mobilities. You have city level mobility because you, you see how people move from one neighborhood to another. And you have also indoor mobility or venue mobility because you want to understand how people move from the seat in the stadium to go to the exit. So particularly we will work with two different concepts. So one is influx, 
So influx is the number of people that is a, it's in a given place at a given time. And this place could be a neighborhood, but also could be a hallway of the venue. And also the, the relationships between origin and destinations. So all the people that is here, where did they come from? Or all, all the people that is here, where are they going to? Those are the two important concepts in mobility that we will study in this talk. And I mentioned data-driven mobility models. So what is a mobility model? Essentially, a mobility model is an equation or a set of equations that allows you to predict one or even the two of the concepts that I mentioned uh, you in the, in the previous slide. Perhaps the, the most famous mobility model is the gravity model of mobility. It's called like that because it's actually the, the gravity equation. So you know that the number of people that goes from a place I to a place G, J is explained by the gravity constant, by the multiplication of the masses of these two places, by any definition of mass that you may use. So for instance, most models used the, uh, as mass the population of a place. So a place that is populated has a larger mass, mass than another, and it may attract more that a place, more people that a place that is less populated. And this force of attraction is modulated by the distance between these two places. Actually, it's a very simple model. And you need data to, to find what is the value of the gravity constant, what is the value of the different exponents of, of, of the mass and the distance factors. Uh, there are other models that do not require data, that do not, do not require parameters. They are called parameter free. But in practice, the gravity model is the most used and also what works best for scenarios within the city. The other models are, are better when you want to understand mobility between cities, not within the city. In our case, we want to understand how people behave within the city, so we use variations of the gravity model. So what type of variations? For instance, we include other variables, or we mix gravity models with um, regression models that allows you to, to have many gravity models in the city, and so on. And why do we talk about data-driven, data-driven mobility models? All mobility models use data somehow, but, but we say data-driven mobility models because here we usually, we derive what's, what's the best model or are the parameters from very large sources of data. So usually mobility in cities is studied with surveys, as I told you at the beginning of the talk, but surveys do not have enough data to understand Fine, fine movement within the city. So the survey gives you the, the big picture of, of the city. But if you want to understand, for instance, the mobility to a, a very specific place, such as Camp Nou, you need more data. And the thing is that that data doesn't exist directly, but there are many sources with indirect data, with digital traces of what people does in a, in a place that you can analyze to get a proxy information of mobility. So for instance, in I'm, I'm pretty sure that everyone that is looking at, at this talk has a mobile phone. So that means that you leave digital traces, digital breadcrumbs, wherever you go, because you may take a picture on Instagram, because you may send a WhatsApp message, because you may get notifications and, and so on. So all, all these interactions leave a record that says your phone was at this mobile phone tower at this time of the day, at this date. And e even if we analyze that data in aggregated or anonymized ways, 
it's so much that we can get knowledge from the city. So that's what we, we do. So for instance, we, we are working with the Barcelona City Council and we have an agreement with uh, Vodafone. So there are three institutions involved in this collaboration. And we analyze the aggregated mobility in the city in terms of neighborhoods and in terms of this grid that you see here. So we, we, can, we can know for every one of these cells in this grid, in this grid what is the, the influx at the city? What is the, origin and what is the origin of the people that is at that destination? So for instance, we have measured what places are most visited by women in the city. So here, darker areas have less visits from women. In the middle, darker areas have less visits from elders. And in the right, darker areas have, or brighter areas have more visits from tourists. So you, you can see that the distribution of visitors here is different, uh, different uh, throughout the city. And here you can also see the, the hot spot surrounding uh, Camp Nou. You can analyze, you can do an analysis, an analysis uh, a hotspot and cold spot analysis of that kind of information to find what are the significantly important parts of the city with more visitors than expected. And, and here with visitors we refer to women, elders and tourists or with less visitors than expected. So for instance, if you see here the, the map in the lower right, see that there is a big area that is usually not visited by tourists. Then, then we will see why. Uh, and here you see what are the areas visited by tourists. Essentially downtown and the beach and the areas surrounded by Camp Nou. Here you, you will expect to see Sagrada Familia and Me Too, and we found that that's what uh, was an error in the data. It's not that Sagrada Familia is not important, it's that the, the data is not perfect. So that's also something that you need to consider when doing big data. The data is noisy, the data has problems. And you need to know when you are looking at a pattern and when you are looking at a problem. But you can also measure the origins and destinations here. So what are the, the most popular places as, as origin? What are the most popular places as destination? And how the different areas of the city are connected according to these transitions, to these displacements from origin to destination. And this is the, the network that we see on the right here. And remember the, the place, the, the area of the city that has less tourists than expected. If you look here, carefully here, you actually see two Barcelonas according to the connections, one in the bottom area and one in the northern area. So it seems that that place of the city, it's kind of disconnected. So of course it, it's connected according to transportation, but according to how people move around the city, it's disconnected from the main Barcelona. So we can, if we use a, um, a gravity model, we already have all the information we need. So we need how much people goes from one place to another. We also know the population of all these different areas because we have census data. It's public data also, but we can, we can add variables to, to this gravity model to, to tweak the definition of mass, to, to add more information. For instance, you, you can download OpenStreetMap data. It's also public, so you can get the, the, the network of streets, the network of transportation. You can also get the number of, of amenities, the venues and amenities available on the city. So for instance, here you, you see, okay, wh where are religion places, churches, for instance, in the, in the city? Or what is the distribution of recreational places, of finance places, and so on, or retail places, and so on. So if you can characterize all your origins and destinations with numbers regarding these amenities or the accessibility to, some, to, to those amenities, you can start adding more information to your gravity model. Uh, and we do that. And for instance, here we, we can say, okay, so if a, if a, if a place has more um, educational amenities than another one, 
the, the influx from one place to another is going to increase. Or the larger the distance between two areas, the smaller the influx in between them. And so on. So those are two, two kind of obvious insights. So if you want to see not so obvious insights, we also have very nice results because we can construct that, that bar chart, that set of patterns that are important to, to go from a place to another at every neighborhood of the city. And we can do this for origins and destinations. So here, every map, the, the blue areas, uh, say that, so for instance, if this place doesn't have any entertainment amenities, such as Camp Nou, it will receive less visitors from that, from a different place. You, you can create this type of maps for origins uh, and destinations. And then if you start to look at the data, you can, you can see, ah, so this place gets this type of visitors. So this place gets visitors that are looking for entertainment and they come from wealthy areas of the city or they come, they are mostly young people because they tend to live in this area of the city that is characterized by young, young people and so on. However, when you look at origin and destination, you usually don't see tourists there because the tourists doesn't, don't, don't have uh, a well-defined origin. Most of them, the origins of our tourists are the different hotels and Airbnbs in the city. And the, this, these venues tend to start to, to be concentrated, particularly in downtown. But there is an open data set from Foursquare. If you don't remember Foursquare, it was a social network where you could check in in a place. You could tell the world, I'm here. So if this, if this course were physical in the Barcelona Supercomputing Center premises, you could post a pulling message saying, oh, I am at Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And then when you go to have a beer with your, um, fellow students, you will say, oh, I'm, I'm, at, uh, I'm at, at this bar in downtown, having a beer with my new friends, and so on. Here is a link to that data set in case you, you want to look at it. So, and this is a heat map of the Barcelona metropolitan area, according to the number of places where people do check-ins. And you can see that it's mostly in downtown Barcelona. So that also tells you that it's mostly tourist. You can analyze the type of place where people do check-ins. Of course, airport is the, the most important. After the airport, which is the, the most important place? Soccer stadium. And, and you can imagine what kind of soccer stadium uh, is where people do the check-in. So this is very interesting because since you have this check-in data and this data has a date, has a place, you can start to create trajectories for tourists. And you can ask questions, so, such as, when do people eat? What does people do before going to Camp Nou or after going to Camp Nou? Um, do people check in in groups? Sometimes, if you have the check-ins before their visit to Barcelona, you can know the origins of these people. You can say, oh, so this particular tourist in Barcelona has also check-ins in Argentina. So maybe he's from Argentina. As I told you at the beginning, so there, here is a link to a repository where I, where I analyze the Foursquare data to generate the, these charts, but also this network of interaction between, between places. You can click on this link. It's a very nice interactive view. And here is the airport, and here is Camp Nou. So you can see that there is a transition here. And when you look at the visualization, it's kind of very nice how it's uh, animated. Having all this network of interactions between places, according to tourists, you, you can create all this transition network. So for instance, where do people go before going to the stadium? Sometimes they check in at the train station. Sometimes they check in at a church. So, so you know that these are tourists because they go, they go from the airport to a church, Sagrada Familia, and then they go to the soccer stadium. Or maybe they go directly from the airport to the soccer stadium. Depending of, of what they do at what time of the day, because if they go to the soccer stadium for the museum, 
then they may go to have food or something like that. If they go for at night, probably they will have will go to have a beer and so on. So all these analyses I, I, I have shown you allow you to answer many questions about how many people go to Camp Nou, what is their demographic composition, what is their local or tourist composition, and what is the routine before and after going to the stadium. If we take all this information together, we can create a profile or many profiles of people that visit Camp Nou. And that means that we can program the rules of, of behavior for the different agents that are going to simulate all these visitors. So if we want to create all these realistic, all these realistic digital twins, we can do, we need to do this kind of analysis. So it's not only agent-based simulation, but it's also data science. So what are some things that we are doing now is to understand uh, how people arrive to the stadium because people don't, do not appear magically at their seats and they, they, they also don't arrive together. So they are arrive with a specific distribution in time and this distribution changes according to the match. And some people go and they haven't eaten. So they need to buy some food. Some people go uh, arrive directly before the game. Some people, if you have a numbered seat, which, uh, which I believe is the case in Barcelona, maybe you do not care about making queues, but for instance, in my country, usually the, the, the seats are not numbered. So you need to get early to get a, a better seat and so on. So we have all these maps of capacity. So, so here's some, here some areas have a bigger capacity, other are more VIP. So you have more space, you have better seats and so on. So we are, we are, we are all building all these distributions to understand not only who visits the stadium, but now how do they visit the stadium? And what are the different challenges that we are facing when creating this, uh, implementing this simulation? So one of them, the operational challenges is that there are very detailed plans, 3D plans, and very spectacular also 3D plans of the stadium but the, the simulation needs a, an abstract view, a simple and abstract view. So we need to convert this architectural specialized plants into something that the program can understand and make people moving. Uh, almost like a Minecraft world. You, you, don't, you don't need the, the looks and the aesthetics of crisis or Far Cry or cyberpunk, you need something that works like Minecraft, something that is very abstract. Because why do you need that abstraction? And here are the, the conceptual challenges. Because we need the rules to be as simple as, as possible. Because the, the most simple the rules are, the more confident we will be regarding how people is behaving. If the rules became complex, we will lose the understanding of how people interact with the environment and how they interact with other people. So it's, a, it's very challenging to reach the equilibrium with, with, between abstraction, but also modeling, expressing the, the behavior that, that you want to, to simulate. And technical challenges. It's not the same to simulate the evacuation of an office where you have at most 100 people with a place that has 100 thousands of agents. So of course, we are at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. We are running this simulation in Mare Nostrum. You can, you can try to, to create some simulation if, if you want now that you have access and you know how to operate it. But you will find that it's very hard to, to organize these agents in space. Because if you want to run something on Mare Nostrum and, to, and take advantage of the supercomputing infrastructure, you need to divide the problem in many smaller problems that can be run in parallel. So that means you have to partition the space. But here, agents interact with the environment and they might interact with things that are in, the, in a different partition. 
in a neighboring partition. So how to synchronize this behavior? How to synchronize and how to implement this effectively? Those are very hard questions to answer. We are, we are working on this. So in summary, so we have seen that IO Twins as a project puts applied research. So this is not only programming, this is not only implement engineering and implementing a, a known solution. We don't know the solution. We are doing research also. And we're putting this research into operation to improve safety and the experience and the experience of facilities, particularly the no car no. We're working now in creating these digital twins of student visitors. And hopefully we will make sure that future events at Camp Nou will be as safe as they can be. And this is and this includes COVID because we can we can include social distancing rules in how the agents behave. So as the chat says, the, the cuckoo said we need to finish the, the presentation. So thank you so much for uh, paying attention. If you have questions. I will be very happy to, to answer them. You can also write me to my email. Here is the, the address. And you can see the, the, the repository with code in this address. These slides are public. So you can use this link to, to see the slides again. So thank you so much. Eduardo? Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, maybe just so the, the talks uh, till now have been very technical. Maybe if you can elaborate a little bit, what technologies did you use to produce these simulations and uh, what frameworks do you use to program that? It will be nice. Sure. Well, um, so there are mainly two aspects, right? The, the, the data driven part and the simulation. So in the data-driven part, we do everything in Python. Um, we are using a Spark for, for some of the data sets. And we're using Pandas and Dask. We, Dask is like the parallel version of Pandas. It's kind of similar to a Spark at somehow. It's not equivalent. It's similar in some points. And we do more, we use mostly Python, Python tools. So, so if you see this, this repo, IOTWINS, Foursquare, it's only Python. The simulation part uses uh, C++ and Python. C++ because it's the, it uses the, the Pandora framework. Pandora is, a, is an open source agent-based modeling framework developed at uh, DSC. You can use Python. But at the end, it's much more easier to express the, the models in C++. I know it sounds weird, but that, that's, <laughs> that's how it is. Um, I think the, the, those are the main technical tools we, we use. Uh, usually when I work analyzing data, I use Jupyter. I do a lot of visualization, but I also use Python for that. Currently, we, we are working on, on visualizing the, the different results of the simulation. Uh, we, here, when, when I did mention this, when, when we say simulation, it's not one simulation. It's thousands of simulations. W one simulation does not generate emergent collective behavior. But when you start to see the same pattern in thousands of simulations, then you realize that Oh, so this is something that happens when people have these behavioral tools. So you need to, to visualize that kind of information. And we are not sure what tools are we going to use. Currently we're using Python, but probably we, we, we will do some kind of 3D rendering of, of these results. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you for the question. Okay, so I, I think that there are no no more questions. Um, so I know you have questions about the cuckoo. It's from Muji, very nice. It doesn't work at night, so it has a light sensor. It, it, it won't wake up. 
and it's very useful to, to limit the, the times of your talks. So if you want to uh, rehearse your talk, it's a very good, it's very good idea to have a cuckoo clock. Okay, so I, I guess uh, um, we are done for today. I hope you have a very nice day and you learned a lot of Spark, but also the type of projects that use that kind of technology. I hope you enjoyed the, the rest of the course and have a nice day. Keep learning, never stop learning. <laughs>